Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second public forum of the year. Uh, my name's Hugh French. I'm an associate at the Melbourne Accelerator Program. And we're very lucky tonight to have with us Martin Hosking. And he's here to provide some insights into how he helped create some of Australia's most successful startups. So a little bit about Martin. Uh, Martin first started his career as a diplomat working in Egypt and Syria. He uh, then joined McKinsey as a consultant. Um, after that, he joined LookSmart, which was an online advertising company based in Melbourne. And he held senior positions through to its IPO on the NASDAQ in 1999. Martin was also chairman of Aconex, a global software as a service provider to construction firms. And in 2006, Martin co-founded Redbubble, a world leading marketplace and social network for independent artists and designers. Uh, so tonight has been filmed, so if Anybody would prefer not to be filmed, please let one of the MAP team know. And the format of tonight will be a 45 minute discussion followed by a brief Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in giving Martin a warm welcome. Hello, I am Martin Hosking. Uh, you heard a little bit about me. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's get started. Uh, okay, let's start with an assumption. Uh, I assume you want to learn how it may be possible to build a global company from Australia. Uh, if that assumption is wrong, I'm going to have to say something very different or you're going to have to leave. Uh, but let's assume it's right, and so we'll assume that that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to chat about three companies. Uh, you may or may not have heard of them. Uh, I suspect you will in some form or other. They are probably uh, three of the most successful companies to come out of Melbourne and out of the Melbourne ecosystem. Um, inter interestingly, all of them have been, were founded by uh, uh, graduates of Melbourne University. Um, so they are LookSmart, which in its day was actually, I was asked at one stage, uh, is it true that uh, LookSmart was worth as much as the Commonwealth Bank? And I said, no, that would be overstating it. But it was at one stage worth as much on the Australian Stock Exchange as Qantas. Uh, those were the days. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. It's no longer worth as much as Qantas. It's no longer worth as much as the cash it has in the bank. It's worth about $15 million. The fact that it still exists is actually uh, more a testimony. It's sort of, it is among the walking dead. Um, then there is Aconex. Aconex is not among the walking dead, quite the opposite. Aconex is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange uh, in December of last year. It listed $1.90 now trading at just on $4 a share, a market cap about $600 million. The co-founders of Aconex are just a few years older than some of you and a bit younger than some of you. Um, both graduates of Melbourne University, Lee, uh, Lee Jasper and uh, Rod Philpott. Um, and I think, no, I think they're still in, no, they, they, Rob has just gone over the 40 year under, so he just got, came out of the uh, young, uh, young rich Australians, but certainly they're in about that age bracket. And then Red Bubble, founded by myself and uh, one other graduate of uh, Melbourne University, another graduate from uh, another institute here in Melbourne. So those are the three companies, which I'll sort of tie together loosely. Um, and I'll tie them together loosely around my experiences with them. Uh, which I have in other places called sort of a series of failures. Uh, we will talk a fair bit about failure, which is, you know, illuminating in itself. Okay, um, when you talk about startups, the first thing that comes to mind is David and Goliath. Um, that is David and Goliath. Uh, all, of the, all of the images here, are, by the way, are from Redbubble. Um, and the interesting thing about David and Goliath, I studied history at Melbourne University, is what an unfair match it was. Uh, Goliath should never have gone into that fight with David. David was always going to win. Uh, if you study the history of ancient warfare, you'd know this. There's uh, three sorts of, uh, of warriors in ancient warfare. There are the, uh, the people who are the, uh, use the bow and, bows and arrows and the slingshots. There's the cavalry and there is the um, infantry. And the rule is that the people who have slingshots and bows and arrows will always beat the infantry and the cavalry will beat the, uh, the, uh, the missile projecting people. So Goliath was a bit of a fool going into that battle because he was going to lose. He's big and he's uh, strong, 
but you try standing up against a rock going at sort of a couple of hundred miles an hour, which is what it can come up with. So David was a little bit, uh, he was a little bit brave. Well, he wasn't that brave, but he certainly a skilled person with a slingshot was always going to beat Goliath. Um, that's, this is actually not just theory, by the way. Uh, if you go back and study your ancient uh, uh, pre-Roman uh, military, you'll find this is actually true. Uh, so there we go, contrary to what the Bible says. But anyway, David, uh, Goliath lost. Um, What's the point of that? The point of it is that when you're actually starting a startup, it feels like that sort of battle. It feels like somebody's going to, somebody's huge. Why am I ever going to win? Why am I ever going to, why am I ever going to have a chance against Google or Microsoft or Facebook or Myers or, you know, in the case of the boys who, who founded uh, Seek back in the day, how on earth did they think they were ever going to launch a, and add a site for, uh, for jobs going up against the absolute Goliath of Fairfax? I'm not sure what multiple Fairfax, uh, Seek is of Fairfax total uh, market cap right now, but it certainly is many times more valuable than, than, than Fairfax. Um, and the reason why they can, we, 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 they, us can win is because of the nature of this battle itself. It's the agility, it's the speed, it's the capacity to do things quicker and be more responsive, which actually allows David to, to, to win against Goliath. I set that as background because I know when you're stowing a startup, when you're getting into that world, how frightening Goliath looks. Uh, you've got to overcome that fear. You've got to actually recognise that you actually you are, you are actually uh, can outclass Goliath, and you've got the uh, the weapons to do so, as David does in this context. So that's a little bit of background. Okay, let's talk about Look Smart. As I said, Look Smart was uh, worth at one stage more than uh, Qantas. This is straight from the slide deck of 1996, and a lot of most of the material I'm going to share with you comes from um, direct, directly from decks. Here's what we said in 1996. Now, some of you, this is you know almost pre-internet, so it might be hard for you to recognise this, but let's see what we said. We said the World Wide Web would win. With World Wide Web Web would win over proprietary networks. This was a day of AOL and the other proprietary networks. Um, and people said, well, you're never going to beat those folks. Why on earth would this internet thing, which was almost brand new, ever uh, have a chance of competing against them? We said it would because it was better. This is actually all uh, thanks to, my, uh, to Evan Thornley, the uh, uh, founder, along with Tracy Ellery of Looksmart. And he was absolutely right about that. And he said that advertising would drive short-term economics. It not only drove short-term economics, it's also driven long-term economics. The advertising market on the, on the internet is, as we know, absolutely huge. It's an incredible advertising vehicle. Um, those first two propositions, you know, a reasonably intelligent person with a reasonable sort of perspective on the world could have come up with those. Um, where Evan sort of triumphs, though, is being a little bit cleverer than that, he also recognised that search engine would grab, engines would grab a major ad share. Uh, that's not as obvious. Uh, the obvious thing would be to say the content companies, those people creating content, the news corps of the world, would grab a major share of the ad, of, of the ad revenue, and that's what they believed. But what Evan had recognised was that uh, people would be looking for content, they'd be looking for other things on the web, and that would pos position uh, search engines in a particularly powerful position. Uh, and he proved to be right about that, uh, as Google has subsequently shown us with its market cap of 400 billion or whatever it is at the moment, something like that. And then he said that there was a gap in the market because at that stage, Yahoo was really the only thing which had launched. Uh, Lycos was coming out the door, Excite was there, InfoSeq was there, but there wasn't much of a market and so there wasn't many companies in that space. So that was the proposition which he came up with. Um, you look at that, and provided you believe all of those four things, the first thing you do after you've done that is throw money at us. Uh, it didn't quite happen like that, uh, but we did get a relationship with Reader's Digest who did decide to fund um, Look Smart back in 96. And so we had, with the Reader's Digest Association, uh, Look Smart would be in a good position to fill this gap. That's a that's probably getting a little bit more of a leap of faith. There was no obvious reason why Reader's Digest Association would be a good partner for, for Looksmart. In fact, it wasn't, um, is the truth of the matter, except for the fact that they were prepared to give us some money. 
Uh, Evan had been doing consulting projects for them uh, with McKinsey um, when that ha occurred. Um, like all good startups, we got some money. We got some money from the Readers of Digest Association. And fairly soon after, within about a year, the strategy at the Reader's Digest Association completely changed. Uh, and so the money disappeared, and we all ended up in the iconic basement. This is a picture of the Redbubble basement, or sorry, the LookSmart basement back in 96. We had actually had to go downstairs, and things had got pretty grim. This is actually in San Francisco. Um, it's a little bit funny because you can sort of, there's, there's a, in the background you can see a, uh, a tube uh, and that's actually the air conditioner. The temperature in the, in the place was, you know, close to, you know, well into the 30s. It could only get, it could only be, well, you can imagine these huge computers, what the, the heat that they're putting out and there's sort of four people to a desk. It was a pretty unpleasant working environment. Um, this, is, this is good uh, because every single, every single successful startup, uh, an unsuccessful startup and failed startup of, you know, and even moderately unsuccessful failed startups have their iconic picture of the basement, and this is uh, the look smart one. So I share it with you for no other reason. Um, as we went on a little bit, uh, look smart got very, very good at telling its story. Um, and this is from an investor deck much, much later. This is back from 1999 now, and we're getting coming up to the IPO. And this is, a, this is a story which we had. Granular content is sites, communities, and e-commerce around specific topics like lupus, arthritis, dried flower arrangement, Greek mythology, fly fishing in Oregon. People and content you can't reach through traditional media. Um, and it's why people are on the web. Now, this is like fancy graphics. It's millions of content providers, look smart, millions of users. Um, that's like, it's, it's pretty good PowerPoint. Uh, and we shared this with the world, and as a consequence of this, Redbubble, uh, sorry, looks smart, I shouldn't make these mistakes, managed to be very successful in raising capital. And I'll talk a little bit about this. So let's talk about the financing of looks smart, because this sort of tracks uh, the history of the company in many ways. So the Reader's Digest put $5 million into, the Reader's Di into, uh, into looks smart in 1996. They then withdrew that money and we went to them and they said, we're not longer going to put any more money into, into this company. Uh, this we said to Evan, Tracy and myself. And we said to them, okay, we're going to close the company down. In order to close the company down, you're going to have to pay out all the leases and all of those sorts of things. That's going to cost you one and a half million dollars to close the company down. And we said, rather than you closing the company down, why don't you give us one and a half million dollars of the, and we'll take on those responsibilities. Uh, this is the sort of the brave moment which many, most, all entrepreneurs have at some stage in, the career, in their careers. I've never heard of one, somebody who hasn't had to do something which is genuinely crazy brave. Uh, this was our crazy brave moment. We could do this because for us to close the company down and shut it all up, uh, if we'd been sued, we didn't really have very much money. We had our houses, but not much else. We probably didn't have much of our houses, is the truth of the matter. So this was that crazy, brave thing which you, you have to do. Uh, and when you talk to entre successful entrepreneurs, they will almost invariably have a moment like that. It's a time when they, they, they leave their high-paying job to join some, you know, uh, trivial startup, and it turns out to be the next Google or the next Facebook or they, you know, they, they put the payroll on their credit card or whatever it happens to. We did a few of those things. Uh, so we took on, the, we took on this respons financial responsibility with absolutely no runway, no, re no revenue, no way of even seeing where the revenue specifically would come. And we did that in 1996. Um, it was moderately insane. Uh, and then we were... We went around and we talked to a whole bunch of, we, we said to ourselves, by the way, that we can do this and we can, uh, we can eke out, we can keep this company alive for a number of, uh, we thought would be two months before we raise capital. Um, that was a little bit optimistic. Never, ever, ever try to raise capital in a short time frame against a deadline. Um, there is something about it. It's the investors sort of, there's something about the smell of a, dying animal which just turns off investors. Uh, and so, you know, if you're, if you're really desperate for capital, 
um, you can guarantee that it's going to take an awful lot longer than you can ever expect. The only time you're ever going to get capital easily and quickly uh, is when you absolutely don't need it. Um, and that was not the case. We, we were desperate for it. But we thought it would take two months. It took six months, a little bit more. And we finally, some, some very nice Melburnians gave us a short-term loan. And this was actually also in the Macquarie Bank when they were still uh, backing startups before they decided not to do that anymore, uh, also participated in that. We got some more short-term debt. And then things start to fall a little bit into place. Um, the, some investors from Melbourne, uh, from Sydney, came along called Anwin. Um, if you ever go up to, uh, you'll see a building which has largely been funded. This amount of money is $2.3 million, which came in from what was called Anwin, uh, is the largest ever returning investment to a venture capital firm in Australia's history. I think they made over 120 times their money on that investment. So, uh, and then Series B, and then we got a, we got a uh, this was all happening quite quickly now, and then we got a uh, Cox, which was a, um, a very large uh, media company in the uh, United States, joined us. And things were starting to flow. We now had quite a lot of money coming into the company. The thing which we did, of course, when the minute this $6 million came in, the first thing we did with it was spend $5 million on placement from Netscape. Uh, so we put it pretty well straight to work, uh, and that gave us a, a, a revenue stream from advertising. Um, and then things got really upfront. Microsoft, we did a big deal with Microsoft, so they gave us $20 million in upfront payments. So now the company is being funded by uh, the cheapest form of finance at all, which is revenue. And finally, so we did an IPO, it's, uh, so a pre-IPO, which is now $60 million, now getting big numbers in 1999. And a whole bunch of people, this was, at this stage, you know, where before we'd have to absolutely had to be crawling through glass, on glass to get the money. By this stage, it's $60 million. You know, we could have raised two or three times that amount if we'd wanted to. People were literally calling us up and saying, can I, desperately, can I give you, a, give you uh, some of my money, um, and we hadn't, couldn't take it all. And finally, we raised $92 million, and we had a $1 billion valuation, and what a wonderful story. <laughs> <laughs> if only it had have ended there. It didn't. <laughs> this, is the, this is the share price of LookSmart. So it's actually on, actually not even, you know, it's in some sort of log scale, I think. Yeah, it looks like a log scale, because this is 44. Some mathematician in the audience will tell me. Yes, it is a log scale. Uh, so we, at this stage, back up here, I'm going, I'll walk over and, you know, at this stage where the share price hits, you know, almost seven, eight hundred dollars a share. Uh, you know, at this point in time, you know, the, the Australian Business Review is ringing me up and working, trying to work out where I, where I rank in the uh, richest uh, 200 Australians. I didn't actually have ever time to publish that because by the, by the time they started publishing, they realised I, <laughs> I was no longer in the BRW Rich 200. Uh, Evan made it briefly for a while because he had more, more stock than I had and even at some sort of valuation. But at this stage, it's sort of six, eight hundred dollars and we're worth more than Qantas. Um, and then, unfortunately, the fantasy ended and reality descended upon us. And so we started that long, gruelling, arduous descent to currently 45 cents. And all of that money, by the way, from about this point on, Redbubble, oh, sorry, LookSmart was never worth more than the amount of money it had in the bank. So it's always this valuation of the company has been entirely underpinned by the amount of money which was actually raised uh, prior. Anyway, it's now worth about 45 cents uh, per share. Okay, that's an interesting story. What will I, what can I, some lessons from it. The first lesson, and you'll hear, see people talk about this, in the world of entrepreneurship, timing is very, very important. Um, LookSmart was very successful because of the internet was there. Um, venture capitalists will talk about this in terms of a wave. Uh, if you're out there having to paddle, it's really hard work. If you can catch a wave, it's a great thing. There was a big, big wave. It was a wave of money. It was a wave, uh, it was a wave around financing. It was also just simply the wave around the internet itself. The second thing, I've shared with you what LookSmart was about, and it had really, really good PowerPoint. Like, we were good at PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> But 
doesn't matter how good you are at PowerPoint, you actually read a really strong strategy behind it. You, almost the more effort you have to put into the PowerPoint is the weakness of the strategy. And you know, I know this is dramatically oversimplifying these things, and I'm sorry, but you know, when I get shown venture, when I get shown investor decks, if I see compelling PowerPoint, it's often because I'm not seeing compelling strategy. Um, and so, you know, there's something about being able to really crisply articulate your, your your strategy, independent of really compelling PowerPoint, which is really useful. The third thing is, and this is important, you can actually make a purse out of a sow's ear, in that old expression. Good people can do it. Um, they do it just because they're creative and then they're imaginative and we, we can, you can make a way to make it work. Uh, I don't think that LookSmart had a lot going for it as a company. I don't think it had very much understanding of its customers or, or negligible understanding of its customers. I don't think its strategy was particularly compelling. I think it was, had huge governance failures. But what I do know is there were some good people who were actually incredibly nimble and could actually just make it work, at least in the short term. There is also a, a, an expression which you may have heard about bigger fools, and that is uh, you can assume in certain market conditions that you can buy something and sell something because there will be a bigger fool. That is true, but eventually you run out of fools. And when you run out of fools, you want to have a business. And, and when, when LookSmart ran out of fools, uh, as the market turned, there was no business underneath it. And one part of this is your business needs to be re resilient enough to survive the worst possible situations which you can go through. If it isn't that, it doesn't have that resilience, there is actually something wrong with it because you cannot simply rely on investors. And this is, you know, of course this is, a, is incredibly relevant right now. The number of silicon, the, the big difference between Silicon Valley companies and companies coming out of Melbourne and Sydney and other places is Silicon Valley companies often are just relying on that next set of investors. They're defining success by their capacity to raise the next round. So that's the bigger fool theory. And finally, customers are the beginning, the middle, and the end. They are everything about a business, and we'll talk about more about that in a second. Okay, next company, Akinex. Um, I'm not sure it had a compelling strategy. This is how they describe themselves. Did anybody understand when somebody, when, when uh, we we're hearing about what Akinex did, with it, what it actually did? I'm going to explained it even more complexly, I choose. Aconex will become the dominant collaboration network for asset-based industries globally. Anybody understand that? I don't think, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> um, and I understand this and make a lot of money for investors. I do, I do get that, that bit. Um, so it was not obvious what the company did, but I invested in the company. I, mean, I, didn't, I passed on the first round, but I didn't make the mistake of compounding that. I invested in the second reason. Around. And the reason why I did it was this slide. This is again from 2006. Absolute clarity about what the customer, what, or who, why people use Aconex. They use Aconex to save time. Each company does so, have reams of data, search, and this is how they describe it. Searching, finding things is, is so much faster. They save money, um, significant reduction in staff costs, careers, printing. They reduce risk. Information cannot be lost or misplaced. Reduces spread and increased control. My due diligence on this company when I was doing the investment was really simple. I, went, I rang three or four of their customers and I said, how important is Aconex to you? And they said, absolutely critical. Would you pay more for this service than you're currently paying? They, and I said, I promise I won't tell them. And I, they said, yes. I did, of course, tell Aconex subsequently because I was the chairman. <laughs> anyway, I didn't tell them who'd said it, but it was certainly true. So there was, a, there was a true customer need, and that clarity was fundamental. There was actually also behind that a really nice strategy, and this was also true. So you have increasing numbers of users, you have higher revenue, you have better products and services. This has been refined in a number of different ways, but it's, it's a network effect. So the more people who are using Aconex, and the people who are using Aconex, by the way, are people who are doing big projects, $50 billion projects, the, uh, the big towers around Melbourne, uh, projects right across the world now. Uh, so you've got a big project, you've got all of these documents, thousands of documents coming in which you need to manage, and the more documents you come in, they get higher revenue, but that also creates better products and services. That was one version of the cycle. There's actually different versions of the cycle, but there's a really nice ecosystem which underpins uh, the way in which this company grows. Basically, the more users they have, the more value it, beco value it becomes. And right now, in the case of a, in Australia, if you're doing a bid project and you're not using Aconex, people are going to ask why. Uh, it is the default. So, um, 
and they raise a fair bit of money. This is the number of users, or so some version of this is a, the value of sales on the site. They raised it in a whole series of rounds, 2001, 2004, the one I participated in, five, seven, and an IPO. And 2008, they raised 100, over $100 million uh, from a venture firm in the Silicon Valley, and then they IPO'd in 2014. It should be 2014. Some lessons from Akinex. These ones don't come through in the slides which have come before. Um, has anybody explained to you what working capital is? Um, I have, somebody's explained to me working capital many times. I, I'd done accounting degree, I can, not accounting degree, I did an MBA. Uh, I, you know, read, read about it, but I didn't understand it. But when you have, uh, what working capital is, is when your accountant tells you you're really profitable, but you have no money, you have no cash. That's, that's working capital. That's actually the thing which pays the bills. To be accounting profitable and having no cash is, um, is a situation which is not sustainable. And the, in the case of Aconex, it's a very profitable company, but its cash flow uh, lags its profitability, and that puts you in a very tight position. That actually did make them dependent upon investors. Um, and in addition, they had real issues when they were raising money. They were also doing it into fairly tight situations, and that caused issues because the people behind the capital is really important. Um, it happened in 2006 and 2008, uh, and then it also happened with the large capital raise from externally. Those investors were putting a lot of pressure on the company and they could really control a lot of what the company was capable of. If you have choices when you're raising capital, think very carefully about it. Think about, you know, you really do want to have, um, your relationship with your investors is going to be, a, a, hopefully, a close, long-term, happy relationship. Um, if you have reasons to doubt why it won't be that, uh, it's look at it carefully. And try and the critical thing to do there is get alignment of interest. In both of these cases, there was not alignment between the people who are investing and the company itself. Uh, that causes real problems, particularly in startups. Um, finally, oh, not finally, um, almost finally, they built for the long term. As a company, those models and where they thought about they will always think about what the company would look like in five or ten years' time. They did that very well, and that enabled, uh, you know, that, that's enabled such a successful listing. Um, while they were building for the long time, they were incredibly bold, uh, and they took some very hard decisions. Um, and those, you know, in terms of the international expansion, you know, there's a certain, within Australia, there's a certain size at which you reach. It's a sort of the Byron Bay size, which happens, and it's when you get to be this successful, and then you say, well, I can go to Byron Bay and retire now. I've got enough money um, at the Byron Bay size. Uh, they never had that Byron Bay size. Nobody wanted to retire. Nobody wanted to walk away from it and take go surfing. So it, when, you know, when they were hitting you know, $10 million in revenue, they were thinking about what it looked like at $100 million. At $100 million, they're talking about what a billion looks like. There's, that, there's a sort of aggressiveness there, um, which is often lacking in Australian businesses. The competitors who were about the same size, obviously, when they started, just didn't have that aggression. They didn't have that capacity to, to make the brave decisions, to raise the capital as needed, but then actually be really bold with it. Uh, and Lee and Rob were both uh, showed that in spades. Now, there's something called the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, I think they had theirs written up very early on. It was to be a billion dollar company. I think that it's now, their BHAG is now 10 billion or 100 billion or some large number. Okay, let's talk about Redbubble. Um, the first thing to know about Redbubble is, you know, why am I here? Um, you need to go to Redbubble and you need to go to Redbubble to buy something. That's, that's what you can do in, in exchange. I'm here to, to promote Redbubble. What do we do? Just briefly. Um, Redbubble, uh, what it does is uh, artists come to Redbubble and they put, upload art and design and then people come from all, and then people come and they shop on it and we, we outsource the manufacturing and arrange for the manufacturing. A few key facts about Redbubble. Um, uh, last year, we did just on $90 million, $88 million in sales, up from 50 the year before and 34 before that. So fast growing. The actual rate of growth is actually increasing right now. Uh, we're going to do somewhere between 130 and 150 uh, this year, this financial year. It's a marketplace, so same network effects. 1.6 million customers last year. Uh, the lifetime value of those customers ever increasing is now at about 130 bucks. Uh, um, 132,000 artists, 15 million images, 
global supply chain, strong management team, raised, had raised only an $8.7 million, and we last just uh, in May we raised 15.5. So this pulls together some of the lessons from the previous two companies and talks a little bit about Redbubble specifically more. This is what, who we are, global lifestyle brand was synonymous with creative individualism, that's what we aspire to be. So Redbubble's the place to go when you can want to get something which nobody else has, which says something about you, your love of skulls or your love of cats, or possibly your love of both skulls and cats. Uh, that sort of stuff, or in my case, whatever I'm wearing. Um, three things I wanted to cover, which is sort of pulling this together. I want to talk about the target, the action, and the actors. These are the three things which I've learned to be uh, globally successful coming from Melbourne for companies. All of the images are from Redbubble, of course, as I mentioned. Let's talk about the target. The four things, clarity of customer, clarity of purpose, clarity of economics, and understand the ecosystem. In the case of LookSmart, you could have walked around the offices and not asked what we did for the customer. Nobody would have done, given you an answer for that but asked who the customer was. And you would have got a different answer from almost every single person in that, in that organisation. Some people would have said it's people who read the content. Some people would have said it's the advertisers. Some people would have said, said it's the, uh, the, the, the press. Uh, some people would have said it's the uh, people who, who are, inter, uh, are distribution partners. Uh, and probably the smartest people would have said it's our investors. Um, because there was, no, um, there was no shared understanding, not of what we did for the customer, of, of who, but even of who the customer was. If you walk around Redbubble and ask who the customer is and what we do for it, and the, every employee doesn't give you a reasonably coherent, reasonably similar answer, I'd be disappointed. Where there's a real understanding of this two customers who are absolutely critical for us. There's the artists on one side for whom which we provide a really important supplemental part of their income, and there's the customer on the other side who's looking for stuff which they can't get anywhere else. It's not the customer who's necessarily, you know, it's a very specific sort of customer, many of whom, uh, many of whom I'm sure are in this room, who is wanting something which is distinctive, who is wanting something speak, which speaks to them. We talk about these people as creative individuals. They're a leading wave. So that, that, that was the first, that's, that was there. Um, behind that as well, uh, clarity of purpose. What are you doing in the world which is actually worthwhile? You know, like, why is this thing worth getting up in the morning to go and spend any time with? It's the sort of question you often ask on a Monday morning. Why should I bother? Um, you know, I could be doing many other things with my time. I could be doing nothing. Um, and People will get up for money for a while. They'll get up to eat, obviously, for a long while. Um, but at some point, they do want to know, OK, is this actually worthwhile in the world? And there is, behind Redbubble, a, f a real sense of doing something important. We're doing something, you, and if people doubt it, they can simply call up one of the artists and say, have I made a difference in your life today? And the answer is going to be yes. Um, and so there's a real sense of doing of, 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 of a mission. Not all, you don't have to be in a not-for-profit to have a mission. You know, good companies with, with good souls have as clear a purpose and mission as any not-for-profit, often, often clearer and more, and more purposeful than not-for-profits as well because they actually have a, a focus. The problem with some not-for-profits, at least, it's hard to get that, that real cut-through clarity. You've got a clear customer. You've got a clear purpose. Let's make some money. So that's clarity of economics. You actually need to, when you, all of this is done, need to know how you're going to actually make money out of this thing. Um, in the case of uh, LookSmart, it really didn't need to know how it made money because it didn't need to make any money because the investors were just going to give us some more, um, and which was fine you know, until, until uh, the number of fools ran out. Uh, but in the case of uh, LookSmart, in the case of Aconex, both companies came through the global financial crisis completely unscathed. We actually, and I was, uh, I was the chairman of Aconex at this stage, and we just started uh, um, uh, Redbubble, and both companies' ex growth accelerated during the global financial crisis. So, you know, that's having just good economics. How am I going to make money from the start? There is very, very little appetite in Melbourne for the business plan which says, we are going to be huge. We're just going to be huge and we're going to tell you how we're going to make money later. Uh, it will be unlikely to get funded here because there is a, because, and, I, and it's actually a good thing because people actually are demanding a clarity of economics. And uh, finally, this is, this is a little bit more subtle. Understand the ecosystem in which you're working. Um, 
you saw the Akinex ecosystem and it's evolved over time. It's, most companies are like an ecosystem. They're not just we manufacture and then we market, then we sell. There's some more, much more, more complex ecosystem at work. There's a series of partnerships. There's a series of people who are invested in this business in different, in different ways. Um, trying to understand, you don't have to understand it from the start, but as you get more into the business, trying to understand that ecosystem is important um, and, and you have a view, at least have a view about it. Um, I was just interviewing some people today and they said, well, who succeeds at Redbubble and who fails? I said, the people who tend to succeed here are those people who actually try and take an ecosystem view of this thing. Um, and I'll just give you a simple analogy is that um, when you say, if you take a look at a forest and you say, well, what's the most important thing out of a forest? And somebody will say, it's the trees. No, it's the plants, it's the animals, it's the sunshine, it's the water. It's actually all of those things. In the case of Redbubble, the artists are important, the customers, are, the, the buyers are important, the, the fulfillers are important. They're all part of our ecosystem. Google is part of our ecosystem. So trying to have some clarity around that is, is really important, taking an ecosystem view. Let's a little talk about the action which you then take. So you've got a really good business model, you've got good customers, you've got to understand the ecosystem. What are you actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis? First of all, uh, making decisions which are, uh, have a value base to them, that they're not just decisions which are you know, random. Try and make the decisions should, the consistency in your decision making over time is going to be co come because you actually make decisions which are based on strong values. And you argue, when you're arguing about a decision, you're actually arguing what's the best way in which the, which, which decision best exemplifies your values. And so if you can get value alignment, and that's that sort of also touches back to the role the board plays and the investors, Choosing investors who are aligned from you from a values perspective is really important. Simple example. It would be really easy in the case of uh, Redbubble to say, let's screw some more money out of the artists. They're there, they want to sell, we could do lots of things, they can make us, they can make us pay, we could make them pay for something. We wouldn't, don't even need to do, run the economics on that, we don't need to do a, a big model, I don't need to put a team of do, evaluating it, it just, it fails the first test, it's, it fails our values. Um, have lean systems. The great advantage, the reason why Goliath can uh, get losers to David is because he's slow. Lean in this sense is more than just the, the, the current methodolo lean methodology. It, what I'm really talking about is lean, agile, these are words which have been picked up, but I'm talking about them in their original sorts of meanings. It's being light, it's being adopting things which are, you know, don't put in place heavy, you know, heavy burdensome systems and processes. You probably won't do it, but in the case of, uh, one of the real disadvantages of raising a lot of money and then trying to spend it is you actually lose this. And you're no longer a startup. You're actually somewhat caught in between. You're like the sort of, you know, the nine-year-old girl who's been given her, her mum's wedding dress. You know, it's not going to fit, really. You've got too, too much money is just going to make things uncomfortable and it's not going to work for you. Actually retaining that agility and actually being lean is just a really important part of, uh, and you see it often, um, Silicon Valley firms lose this because they raise too much money and they're trying to spend. You go into their offices and you go, oh my God, it's the office of BHP or PricewaterhouseCoopers. You know, how did you spend so much money so quickly? Uh, and, that's, uh, and they put in place these really heavy things. Um, learn, you're gonna be learning quickly. You know, that's, if you, and embed that into, you, into what you're doing. Don't be afraid of it. You know, learning's hard in a way. Uh, but one of the other things is that, you know, acknowledging when you make mistakes, that's good. You know, mistakes good uh, and learning. Uh, and then having done all of that, and this sort of follows through, expediency and the, you know, the definition of expediency is taking something for, uh, for short-term gain, which is going to uh, cause you long-term pain. Um, if, you, if your aspiration and, and, our, and my aspiration in all of these companies has been something which genuinely endure, endures, you'll make decisions, you ha will start to build for the long term fairly early on. It's a little bit balanced between that and the lean, leanness of your systems, but there's critical points at which you just have to uh, expend on not being expedient. I'm running beautifully to time. And then you've got your place, you've got your, your business model, you've got your customers, you've got all of this and you're acting right. Now you've got to have the right actors. You've got to actually get people who you can work with. Um, one of the, f the first people who you'll be involved in is your co-founder. And there will be a co-founder. Um, <laughs> there has to be a co-founder, I'm saying this. There are very, 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 very few Michael Dells in this world. Who can actually be the, who can actually take a single idea and be that 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 person? Uh, almost everybody else, uh, including Steve Jobs, who had whatever his Mr. Wozniak, 
including um, Bill Gates, they all have, there's always a co-founder, and there are reason, there's a real important reason for that. Any idea which at least two people can't believe in is unlikely to really, if you can't get those first two people, how are you going to get the third, fourth, fifth, fifth first million people to believe in it? So two, co two people is great, three is just as good. So have your co-founders, so that's the first person. And, and, they, and you share that, and you'll share your skills because you're also not going to have enough skills to do it. Uh, my co-founders, uh, Peter Stiles and Paul Van Zeller uh, at Redbubble have been absolutely critical to what we've done. They brought very different skills than I did. Um, looking for commitment. People, it's, uh, startups are incredibly long and painful and arduous, so you're going to have somebody who's prepared to walk through the desert with you. Energy, and this is out of people who you're recruiting for. Uh, people who suck, take energy away from you, take energy away from the system. Uh, are not going to last long, or you won't last long, or something will happen. They have to be. You have people bringing energy into it. You're going to need uh, the one thing about um, startups is, unfortunately, they are also little versions of very big companies, uh, and so they do actually have to have a royal range of skills in them. You're going to need some bit of HR. You're going to need to have. You're certainly going to need all of the presentation skills. You're going to need a bit of accounting. So trying to get as many of those early skills into the business is important. If you're um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you will bring all those, you'll have those people, you'll bring those people around you and you can gather them quite quickly. Um, if you're here in Melbourne, you probably, that's a little bit more difficult, but you certainly, uh, you're gonna, it means you're going to have more co founders, but you're also going to have to uh, reach deeply into a broad network to bring it. Um, diversity as well. You know, companies are great, startups are great if there's a little bit of diversity. You know, I'm always a bit worried by companies which look a bit, mon and, and one of the markers of failure is that there's just not enough, this is within the broader group, not just the founders, there's, they just look a little bit too um, uh, of the same mould. And some of the Silicon Valley companies certainly have this characteristic, not the, not the really good ones, but, but they have, you know, there's a notion of actual genuine diversity. And I don't, I don't mean by that, you know, uh, race or religion or, you know, sexual preferences. What I really mean is, you know, do, do you have artists and designers and engineers and marketers and creative people, all of those, those broad set of people which you need to make a company work. Companies which just get too narrow, narrowly focused say, on engineering or sales uh, will often fail because they don't have that diversity. They need the other diversity as well, which is incredibly useful. Um, and finally, as you're recruiting, you're often recruiting for cultural fit. If you are a company who, which is going to be you know, heavily motivated by one set of behaviours, you want people who actually fit within that. That's actually not contrary to diversity. You know, you, there's a certain, certain set of things which are, are non-negotiable, but, we'll, but after that, there should be the cultural fit. Um, and after that, luck is not chance, it's toil. Fortune's expensive, smile is earned. And all of the companies which we've talked, I've talked about, we've had moments of luck. Uh, but I tell you what, that luck comes after you've been at it for a long time and suddenly you, know, you get lucky because you're just there in the game. Um, and then, just a reminder, it's tough. You will massively screw up. In every single, com in every single one of those companies, they're massively screwed up. We have massively screwed up at Redbubble. And at uh, Aconex, I know, certainly, and certainly at Looksmart. Uh, it's whether you, how you survive and how you come out of those, uh, those screw-ups and whether you're, you're ready for the next battle as this uh, little guy is. Um, two final thoughts. Um, over time, your internal, brand, your internal culture will be reflected in your brand. Whatever you say about you, however you treat, however the employee base works, however you work with, however the, whatever the culture is internally, that will begin to be your brand. Um, and whatever processes you have to set strategy, those process and strategy will also begin to come, come together as well. Strategy which simply comes from above, which isn't deeply embedded in understanding of customers, et cetera, will be poor, poor strategy. So good processes will tend to produce good strategy. Good culture will tend to produce good brand. Those things tend to come together. And that is the end. I'm on time. That's question, Kat. So now we'd like to open up the floor to questions. Andrew. And if you decide to wait till the microphone can reach you so everybody else can hear. Thanks a lot for the chat, Martin. Um, I just had a question just with regards to your days at LookSmart. Um, so you mentioned that you became PowerPoint experts and you guys, you know, went around pitching effectively and had no revenue and 
you know, weren't sure when you were going to get revenue. Did you truly believe in the vision and you're 100% convinced or did you sort of at some point feel you're selling snake oh, oil? No. After, after, the, after, the, after the 50th uh, venture capitalist had told you that <laughs> it's not going to work because there was a lot of people saying no to us early on. You get to, you, you absolutely doubt it. Um, there is a sort of resilience which you have to have when you're doing this stuff as well. You know, it's because it, it's, a, it's a really weird, weird thing, you know, the, sort of uh, because you're, you've, you're a bit of a pilgrim. You're out there it's explore, on, your, on your own um, in, as a way in a startup, And, you know, you're going to, a lot of people are going to tell you it's going to fail. They, that's like the default position, uh, which is, and unfortunately, it's right most of the time. So to actually be resistant to that you, is, is actually hard. It does require sort of in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of confidence. Or so yes, you doubt it, but you overcome the doubt, you know, and you overcome the doubt probably on a day by day basis or even an hour by hour basis at some stage. Yeah. Oh, that's my timer. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. There's one at the back. Um, uh, after going through so many rounds of, of fundraising, how much of a company does a founder typically end up with? And also, um, what did your investors do to, to help you the, and the companies? Yeah, um, it, it's just, it, it, there's no single answer to that question. It just varies so dramatically, you know. Uh, some founders, you, I, in general, if you've got professional, strong professional investors, they're very reluctant to take the founders below about 10, 15, 20 percent. You know, they, they, they've got their own reasons for wanting the founders to be incented at that level. Um, but it can be anywhere from 10 to, you know, more, more than 50 percent that founders retain. It's, re it's rarely going to be 50 percent. You know, it's going to be somewhere, you know, in that sort of 10 to 50% range typically. I think that one of the dangers of founders becoming too aggressive and not in terms of trying and not recognising the value which the money brings into the equation, that's certainly one of the criticisms which people have. But you also, on the flip side, you don't want investors who are really trying to screw down the founders because there's absolutely, it's a wrong thing to be doing. You want the founders to be remain, you know, still very well incented and very uh, by the whole thing. Um, in terms of what the investors bring, it varies a lot. Um, uh, they, the one thing I will say is that they, they probably don't bring as much as they say they're going to bring, um, you know, because they do promise that they're going to bring a lot. It's one of their reasons for saying why their, their valuation is lower than yours because we bring so much to the table. But they do bring something, and it, it varies very. You know, in the case of uh, Redbubble, we've had a, I've had a really good set of investors who have come in, and, and I regularly will call them up and ask them for help for hiring for people. Uh, they make up my board. It's, it's initial boards were all investors. So Simon Baker, who's the founder of Real, RealEstate.com, was on the board. You know, and I, I call these people up. You know, can you recommend a good PR firm in Europe? Uh, and, and those sorts of things. And oh, 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 can you recommend somebody to help us with hiring in the in the Bay Area? So yes, they do help in those in those ways. Um, um, it is always an issue that with any with any external party is that they are not going to understand your business as well as you do. Uh, and so that have, balancing that like that information gap is quite important. So it's actually you know, is often reaching out to them around specific things rather than how would you solve you know because it, because you actually do know more about your company than they do. Hopefully, almost invariably, but sometimes you know the yeah. Sometimes they do actually know an awful lot. Mm. Yep. Yes, some microphones. Hi, Martin. Thanks yes. for the talk. <clears throat> I just say question about um, you mentioned about network effects um, mm. business. If a concept requires the network network effects um, greater than let's say Australia, yeah. to be a successful company, what is the difference within the startup culture here in Australia versus that in Silicon Valley and what are the activities of success to, to, to yeah. translate into the global scene? Yeah, um, interestingly enough, Australia's actually had a pretty good success with marketplace businesses and one of the reasons why, uh, so there's Invato, which is based down here, I don't know whether you know Invato, uh, Aconex is not that red bubble, there's 99 designs and site point, um, there's obviously Seek and, uh, and REA and the, and the other classified businesses here, what if. Um, 
uh, carsales.com. The reason why those marketplace businesses often done well, including those ones which have been global, is because they're actually less capital intensive once they get going. Um, so it, um, the marketplace tends to grow in and of itself without requiring a lot of capital to scale it up. In contrast, Aconex did require quite a lot of capital to scale it up. Um, so marketplace businesses are good, but they're hard to get started because you've got both sides. You've got to have both buyers and sellers in whatever your marketplace is. Once you, once you get those, it then starts building on itself. So there, so that's an advantage, you know, Australia's oriented itself towards marketplace businesses because they are less capital intensive, including ones which can work globally. There's not that many of us that there's sort of, uh, there's Redbubble um, and Vato and sort of 99 Designs site point. There's a few others. Um, so uh, uh, I think that in, in this case, I think that the, the, the challenge in Australia is often you just are going to have to assume you're going to have less capital than, than you would have in the US. It, it would be very, very difficult to do a business like Uber or Airbnb out of Australia, is the truth of the matter, because an Uber, you know, it's just billions and billions of dollars to make that work. And the reason why is it is that every network is entirely local. You know, it doesn't actually have a global footprint. It's only, like, it doesn't matter that there's, uh, there's, a, there's a million cars on, on Uber at any given point if there's none in your street, you know? Whereas in the case of, of, of Redbubble, it, you know, the fact that there's 13 million de designs on the site and we can cover every, every possible human interest is actually, there are 13 million for everybody in the global basis. It actually doesn't have to be a local marketplace where Uber does require a low. So it's really thinking through the complexity of your business model. If you've got a business model uh, which looks like it's going to have to scale incrementally on market by market, then you need to prove it out on market by market basis. And I think there is more capital in Australia now. And if you can actually prove that out, it is it's possible to fund it. But I think you probably will end up getting funding from overseas. So in the case of Aconex, $100 million came from overseas, that came from San Francisco. Our capital, which we've just raised, uh, one was an Australian investor, one was in the UK, and one was out of Hong Kong. So there is more money coming, being prepared to come into Australia and some active investment from firms like Excel and others who are investing now in Australia. If you can prove out how, you, how, how your network will grow, if it has to grow you know, sector by sector or region by region, whatever it happens to be. Uh, just a quick question about the co-founder. Um, do you... Because I've never actually thought about that before. I didn't realise it was so necessary. But um, how does it work? Do you get them to have a buy-in of it or is it just they come on board and then they get a percentage of the company? It completely depends upon how you structure it. If, if, they're, and if, you, if you both come at it together, then you, you're probably going to you know, have that really hard negotiation and then split it 50-50. Uh, if they're coming in later and they just sort of, you know, then it depends how much work and how much capital you've put into it. And so it's very, very, very variable. In the case of... Uh, uh, of, of, of Redbubble, I put in an awful lot of the, the capital. We, we've, we've, we've worked out how much we're going to value our time. So we're going to value our time equally and then, and then whoever put in, was putting in capital got that extra value. Uh, so, and that ended up with a disproportion because I was bringing the capital. I've seen, I've seen companies where somebody get a whole chunk of it because they bought the server, you know. Yeah. So it just, it, just, it just varies. But I, it, it's relatively, you know, you say this is how much I think the IP is worth, whatever you've created already, yeah. and then how much work I'm going to put into it, and then how much work you're going to put into it. Maybe those get valued at the same, and then how much capital everybody's bringing. So that, it's just an equation. Um, hello. Um, my question is: uh, Is there a legal figure or um, somewhere to some somehow to protect your idea if uh, it is not an invention? Um, because you will have to explain what is it about to your shareholders or to investors. Is there some way that we can keep it for for uh, us? The answer is going to be: There's going to I'm sure there's some IP lawyers in the room who are going to argue with me, and I'm going to say it, no. <laughs> the very, very difficult, um, and 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 particularly from investors, the most sophisticated investors won't sign what's called a non-disclosure agreement, um, which is that I will I promise not to do anything with this idea which you the ideas which you share with me. Um, Essentially, that's what it says. But they mostly won't sign it because they can't be sure what you're going to share with them until you've shared it. Um, and so they don't know whether they may already know something similar. Uh, and so it's very difficult. The thing which you have to do, and which I've done and occasionally got caught out with, is do a, try and 
find do some due diligence on your investors before you talk to them about what it is. And if you think that they are likely to be in a similar space, then really the only thing you can do is not tell them what it is going to be. Um, and unfortunately, at least some venture capitalists are actually a bit tricky about this. And they will, you know, in the, the trickiest bit is that they call you up and say, look, we're really interested in investing in Redbubble. And they say, great, would you want to talk to us? And they say, oh, fabulous, love to talk to you. You tell them all about what, you, what you're doing and then they say, oh, we've just invested in your competitor. <laughs> okay, you know, not quite like that, but that dialogue, it literally happened, you know, and you try and get into, you know, trying to, you know, but trying to do that, and this is where things go wrong, there was sort of things, when I talked about things going wrong with investors, that's one of the issues that try and make sure that they're not, that they're actually genuinely investing and that they're not likely to have something which is directly competitive to you. But there's no legal arrangement which is, I've never, ever, ever heard of anybody getting sued about a non-disclosure agreement and unless the thing's actually enforceable, which I don't think it really is, and almost not worth signing um, in my, you know, that it's just almost unheard of. So this, the, the legal document which you could sign is not worth the paper it's printed on, I think. And lawyers can put up and say, you're wrong, Martin, because we still, do, we still use them, but more so that people think about it. We're rapidly running out of time, so if we can maybe take one more question. Uh, Martin, thanks for the talk. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about the network event effects with yeah. Aconex. Um, obviously with social media and community-based sites, you can share things on Facebook and mm. through Instagram and all those sort of methods. Um, but what would you say are the most effective yeah. ways of going out, going about building like a B2B yeah. um, business? So where the real network, network, network effect in Aconex is actually not what I showed. That's sort of there. The real network effect is that after, after a while, people are getting used to using the system and they're actually going from, because it's project-based software, they're going from project to project and when they move on the next project, they actually will often want to take Aconex with them or recommend Aconex. So you've got the sort of like, it's a, you know, it's a little bit like the, you know, one of those, the viral thing happening genuinely <laughs> in that they sort of replicate themselves and they actually go out and they're now on a new project and, okay, everybody in that project, they also want to use Aconex and, and it becomes that familiarity with the system which they're actually transporting with them uh, as, and that's the, that's the real network effect is around those users itself. That if, and then everybody on that new project is forced to use it and then therefore they replicated it itself. That's an unusual network effect, to be honest, uh, because of the, and that's because it's very project based and the project then replicates. Um, Atlassian, interesting, so the guys out of Sydney, they will talk about their network effects and that um, that is different because they sell, they sell into company after company. Um, and that often happens, and the reason why they talk about it is because it's very low price point, and so the decision to use it last in is often made by somebody right you know, who says, oh, let's use it last in for this tiny little project within the company, and then it sort of replicates itself through the company itself, and the reason why they got to that, their whole pricing model was based around somebody with a credit card could make a decision to adopt this, you know, software infrastructure system. It wasn't being approved by the IT department, didn't have to go through requests for proposals and all that sort of stuff. It could just literally be on a, on a, on a credit card. And a lot of people are now have adopted that model, which allows it to be replicated through enterprises. So an enterprise decision literally being made by you know, very junior staff. So that's a different network effect. So I think it, when you talk about, when I talk about network effects or systems thinking, it's really understanding that. And the guys at Aconex, at Aconex and Atlassian really did understand how those things work. And it's quite specific to your business. Well, uh, Martin, thank you for being so generous with your time and for sharing some of your insights with us all this evening. Uh, we have a small token about appreciation here from the MAP team, but would uh, everybody please join me in thanking Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.